Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 137. I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode. I'm so glad you're here. Well, coming up on this week's Friday Fundamental, we've got a special guest going to be helping me out relay some information to you around some really cool Friday Fundamental topics. So looking forward to that. And on that episode, I'm going to share with you where you and I can meet in some upcoming months for some networking and education together. So really excited about that. Now, today's guest is Clayton Morris. Clayton first aired back on the show in episode 91 way back when. It was then Clayton shared his story as a former Fox News anchor who left the number one cable news show in the world after achieving financial freedom through real estate investing. Well, Clayton now devotes himself to helping others buy their first rental property, build passive income, and achieve financial freedom through his turnkey rental real estate company. Today, I'm going to be visiting with Clayton about the seven steps to your first rental property, where Clayton shares so much great advice and actionable content. So really excited to have him back on the show today. So without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode with Clayton. Today, I welcome back on the show our guest, Clayton Morris. Hey, Clayton, thanks so much for joining us again. Hey, Jacob, great to be back. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, yeah, it's hello, our... hello to all of your audience. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Clayton, you first uh, aired on the podcast episode 91 way back when. And so, uh, you know, it's good to have you back on the show, kind of touch base with us. Now, for the audience members who maybe didn't listen to that initial podcast with you on, could you tell us just a little bit about yourself, how you got started investing in real estate, and kind of your unique journey up to this point? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I grew up with a lot of real, you know, negative associations with money. And uh, that kind of set the pace for my whole life. It's something I fought against my whole life. You know, uh, hey, money doesn't grow on trees. We're not worthy of money. We're not, we're not the Rockefellers. I heard that growing up a lot. So that was kind of, <laughs> that was kind of the presence with which I, you know, my parents would talk about money around me. And uh, so I started out in the TV business. You know, I knew I wanted to work in broadcast television. And, and so I moved across the country and was a reporter for CBS News in Montana. And then, you know, making no money. You make no money, like $23,000. and Living all over the country as an anchor for an NBC affiliate in West Virginia and on and on and on. And, and then eventually, you know, I was renting the whole time. So I kind of saw that happening. And then eventually I made it to the network, uh, Fox News Channel. You know, the number one network in the world. And, and uh and got to anchor the number one morning show in the world. Um, and I was sort of pinching myself and uh, a show called Fox and Friends. And that was back before it got like super political and all, you know, just kind of with the crazy stuff that we're dealing with now. A simpler time. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, we would do fun cultural stories and I was the fun morning to show guy and we would do politics here and there. We'd have senators on and we'd interview presidential candidates, but we also had a lot of fun, you know, and, and the whole time I was there, you know, I was I was buying real estate. I was starting to invest in single family homes, which is the bread and butter of what I do. And I still believe, you know, single families is is you know to me it's a it's the it's the best way to build wealth. Um, it's it's and it's also the, the the sort of the safest way to build wealth too. We can go into that a little bit later. But I was doing that while I was at Fox, and the reason I was doing it while I was there and just doing it on the side, and I built Morris Invest, my company which was just sort of born organically out of doing deals myself. I had friends and family were coming to me saying, Hey, you know, can I buy one of you, you know, like these $50,000, $60,000 houses that you've, you know, rehabbed and placed a tenant in. And I'm like, sure, sure. And so it kind of grew organically from there. Friends referring friends, doctors referring doctors, and then it just kind of exploded. But um, the reason I was doing is because I lost my job about a number of years before I got to, to the network. And a station in Philadelphia just didn't renew my contract because they wanted to take the show in a more, a more of a hard news kind of direction. 
And they're like, you know, you're the fun morning guy. We want to take the show in a different direction. We're not going to renew your contract. And you're only as good as your next contract in this business. It's still a paycheck. It doesn't matter if you're making six figures. And I flash back to watching my dad lose his job when I was 12 years old. And so if you're a slave to that paycheck, if you're a slave to somebody else and a 401k plan, you know, you're not building true wealth. And so I said, that's it. I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to try to find another job in TV, but I'm going, I'm going to do something for myself that builds my net worth and builds a safety net that I never have to worry about someone telling me, you know, hey, we're not renewing, renewing your contract. And that's what I did. Yeah, I love it. And you know, th- that, uh, that point, Clayton, hits people at different times in their lives. Maybe some people start out earlier. Some people, you know, figure it out later that, hey, you know, you've got to do something for yourself, build, build wealth, achieve financial freedom, which is, you know, the name of the show here and what we're all about. And uh, you figured that out, you know, midway through your career. So, you know, talk us through, you know, you know that, that shift and buying that very first rental property and what was going through your mind and what were your goals and, and uh, you know, kind of walk us through that very first deal and how'd you do it. And, uh, you know, how, how can other people do it? You know, people are out there in a similar position. How do they get that very first deal? And then, you know, what do they do next? So I have seven rules of real estate investing, which we can get to here, and I can break each one of them down for you. But yeah. Before, okay. we, before, before we kind of get into that, I think it's important for people to realize that at some point you're going to screw up. You're going to lose money, right? Um, you're going to work with a bad contractor. You're going to work with a bad property management company. You're going to have an eviction. I just... Uh, a friend of mine who's a legend sort of in the multifamily uh, real estate space, he's actually not buying any multifamilies right now because it's just they're way overpriced. And so he's, but he was saying, you know, I've literally been burned by anyone in the re- title company, realtors, everybody. <laughs> and has he, has, has he stopped? No. It's just part of the process. If you build that into your knowledge base before you dive into these seven steps, if you just know, hey, maybe... And actually, the good news is if on your first deal, you pay a little too much, maybe you get burned by the flooring guy. If on the first deal, you kind of go through that, good for you. Because guess what? <laughs> by the, when you're in your 50th deal, you'll have already had that. A lot of people kind of wait. A lot of people don't have to deal with it until their 20th deal. You know what I mean? I, I don't know about you, but. I'm sure you've gotten had, have you ever had in real estate ever? (laughs) Oh man. Uh, you know, it's funny you say that because yeah, your very first deal, my very first deal has gone wrong in so many ways. And I just look at them as lessons learned. I knew going into it, Clayton, like, Hey, this is going to be an experiment. Like this was my, you know, experiment property. And I I tell a lot of, I tell a lot of stories about this property. So the audience members know this is my very first property. And yeah, just, it's just, it's just all, everything you could think has gone wrong has gone wrong with it. And I just rolled with it and, learned all those lessons on my next deal and my next deal. So yeah, absolutely. I love, I love the mentality of going into it, knowing that you're going to mess up, you're going to stumble, you're going to fall. There's going to be, you know, trials and tribulations, but just getting through it. Yeah. I mean, we recently, I mean, we recently worked with a provider that just like basically didn't do the rehabs the way they were supposed to, didn't manage the properties the way they were supposed to. And, you know, I mean, that, you know, that was, and that was a real, real disaster. You know, um, I remember I overpaid for my first deal to go back to my first deal. I overpaid a little bit too much. Uh, it was a short sale when I bought it in Michigan and I over upgraded. I spent a little too much money on the upgrade. Yeah. I put in appliances when I didn't have to. Uh, you know, most of the houses I do now, we don't even have to deal with appliances. The tenants pay for their own appliances. I put them in myself. I did some extra bells and whistles. You know, I was even asking the guy that I bought it from, I said, should I put in like a nest learning thermostat? Should I? And he was like, Oh, are you crazy? $5 Honeywell, you know, thermostat. You don't do that. You know, are you crazy? This isn't an A class property. This is a good solid B class rental, C class rental. You don't need to be putting in granite countertops. So at least you learn at the beginning, but if you build that in knowing, yes, you are going to make a mistake here and there, you know, you're going to have a bad tenant. If you're managing properties yourself, you might screen a tenant poorly and, you might have to deal with an eviction for four months while a tenant kind of doesn't pay and maybe files bankruptcy at the last second. You know, you're going to go through that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, if you can if you can go into this thing knowing that you're going to have some some pitfalls and some traps and some, you know, kind of punches to the to the chin. And, uh, if you know, you can protect your downside, you know, you'll make it out the other end just fine. So, yeah, going in, just kind of knowing that, you know, there are going to be some rough patches and you just got to get through them and use them as learning lessons, I think is really valuable. 
Yeah. I mean, and also bottom line, remember it's real estate. So it's not a stock where it goes down to zero dollars in value. Like if you if you end up in a situation where, um, you know, a contractor burns you or there's other issues that happen. Remember, you still own real estate. You still own a property on land that you have a deed to. And therefore, you can. Um, you know, you, you may have to take a little bit of a loss here and there and you write that off on your taxes. If you're a smart investor, you understand how that works. But you are not it's not zero dollars in value. You, you haven't lost everything like, a, you know, like a stock market just evaporates. Uh, so remember that when you're going into this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Clayton, let's let's get into those seven points you talk about. And, uh, you know, these the seven steps to, you know, buying your very first rental property. What does what do those look like? Well, I mean, and, and this is not a plug for, for this, but really is setting your setting a goal. And I've got a freedom number cheat sheet, which we give away on, on our website for free. It's like three pages. I it's the it's I think honestly, it's brilliant, by the way, too. I love that. So, you know, yeah, definitely. Oh, thank I, you. Yeah. So, I mean, it is the thing that changed my life. And I'm not even blowing smoke when I say that. When my wife and I said to ourselves, wait a minute, what, we, we got to set a goal for ourselves. What are we doing? We don't even know our expenses. We don't even know how to figure out how many rentals it'll take to, to get us to financial freedom. And that's where this freedom number cheat sheet comes from. So it's just on our website. It's free. Um, just morrisinvest.com slash freedom. So number one, set a goal. So you don't have to use our cheat sheet. I don't care. But just sit down with your, you know, your partner. Sit down by yourself. Map out what your expenses look like. And ask yourself the why. Why am I doing this? That's more important than the mechanics. You know, I don't care how Jacob invests. I don't care how I invest. Is it single families? Is it billboards? Is it mobile home parks? Is it multifamily? I don't care. Is it Bitcoin? Is it gold? Is it buying businesses, car washes, like on Breaking Bad? Yeah, I don't care. Whatever you're doing, you know, as long as you're creating cash flow and passive income. So now set a goal for yourself and ask yourself, why am I doing this? And then what is my financial goal? So for, for my wife and I, when we figured out our freedom number, we knew that we wanted to hit a certain number of rental properties in order to cover our monthly expenses. And so those monthly expenses were X number of dollars. Great. Then we reverse engineered the number of houses that were spitting out $700 a month in cash flow. It was simple, right? So if I buy another $50,000 property, I buy it for 30 or so, put 20 into it, and it's spitting out seven dollars $800 a month. That's a good number. Now I know that number. Now how many of those do I need in order to cover my monthly expenses? So number one, you have to put a goal. Know that you want to get to five properties, seven properties, and put that on your refrigerator, on your whiteboard, on your, on your iMac with a stick it, a posty note so you see it every morning and you meditate on it and you will hit that goal. Some stuff will start to happen and you will move towards that goal. So number one is set a goal. So number two on the list, if I just rattle them off here, is find a property. So there's a, an old adage, right, which is you, need, there's, you only need two out of three things in real estate. Okay, there's money, there's connections, people, and there's a deal. Now, if you don't have a deal, well, then you need to find people, right? You need to maybe find a, a realtor who deals with off-market properties or maybe find a wholesaler in your market or maybe you call a company like ours, you know, and we have deals. Or you go out on the weekend and kind of hunt. You do some direct mail, try to find something in your own backyard, do that. And then the other piece is the money. Well, if you don't have the money, then chances are you're going to be able to, you know, get one, at least one of those three things. So, okay, you have some people. Now, they're able to maybe bring you a deal. They're also probably going to be able to connect you with, uh, you know, with money, with some private money or otherwise. Or you right. use a bank. Or you've got money in the bank. But you need to go out and find a property. And what are we looking for? We're looking for properties that we can add value to. So am I going to pay for the most expensive property on Zillow? No. I'm going to find stuff that's not on Zillow, right? That's not on <laughs> Ideally. <laughs> Ideally, right? I'm going to try to work and try to you know, do some direct mail. I'm going to get on the for sale by owner section of Craigslist and just make 100 phone calls. And I guarantee you're probably going to find a deal. You know, that is if you want to be buying in your own backyard. Maybe you're in San Diego. So that's not a good place to invest in, in single family homes, right? So you need to kind of look elsewhere. You need to go out where you can find more inexpensive properties like we do in the Midwest and other areas. But you got to find a property. Once you've identified a property, maybe you can get leverage on it. Maybe you can you know, borrow from your 401k in order to buy it. Um, or maybe you can buy it with cash. You've got a self-directed IRA. There's any number of ways to get funding for properties. So don't let that hold you back. But number two is you got to find a good deal. Don't overpay 
for a property. There's just too many fish in the sea. And as the economy starts to go down, which, you know, all signs seem to be pointing that way in the next year here, you know, then there'll be even more, more deals out there. Right. So okay. Freak out about it. So, all right. You with me? I'm not, I'm not losing everybody right here. So no, no. number one, <laughs> setting a goal, finding a property. Number three, very, very important. You want to calculate the return on investment. Okay. The ROI. Now, I've got a YouTube video where I break this down very, very simply in our Morris Invest YouTube channel. So it's just kind of walks you through with some whiteboard stuff. You can see exactly how to do it. But back of the envelope way of looking at it is I want to take the monthly rent and I want to multiply that times 12. So is it 800 bucks times 12? Then I'm going to multiply that times 0.6 because I'm going to take out 40% for vacancy repairs expenses. So I'm going to multiply it times 0.6. That's going to back out those conservative numbers. And then I'm going to divide it by the all-in cost of the property. So am I paying 50 grand for it? And then that'll give you your ROI. So now I like, when I buy my properties, I'm typically between, you know, 7 and 11, maybe even 12% return on investment. That's what I want to see in cash flow coming into me every month or every year. So I want to be between like seven and 12. So most of the properties like we sell are in that range, maybe mostly between like eight and 11% return. But occasionally I've got some properties that, you know, a little pricier, but they're more of a B class play. So the ROI is going to be a little lower, a 7%. But look, the stock market, treasury bonds, I mean, you're, what are you down the 3% range? Oh, it's insulting. Yes. <laughs> so even if you're at 7%, that's a home run. I mean, there's people that are lending private money to real estate investors at 5% returns, 4% returns, because that's even 1% more than what they can get doing conventional stuff. So remember that even a 7% return and you're increasing your net worth, you're in, you're also protecting yourself on taxes. It's a home run any way you slice it. Uh, and plus you're getting the equity as well in the property as it appreciates. So don't be discouraged. I mean, kind of keep that range open and uh, seven to 12% is a good rule of thumb. Although on the 12%, they're just getting harder and harder to come by. Um, it, you know, it's, I've had, I have a lot in my portfolio that hit that number and above, but it, you know, on the acquisition side, it's just harder. It's getting harder and harder to find that stuff. I know multifamily guys that are buying stuff at 3%. Return. Yeah, it's yeah, just just crazy. But yeah, okay. So calculate the ROI. You've got some simple napkin math that you use. Uh, factor out expenses for mortgage, insurance, taxes, all of that thing, and then you've got a, an end number you want your your house to hit. So really like that. You've got that criteria in mind. So yeah, good. Number four then is you got to take action. So here's where people stop, right? <laughs> they, they set a goal. They're excited. They tell their spouse. They got it put just post-it notes up on their iMac. You know, they're, they they found a property. They're excited about. They calculated some ROI, and then they find excuses like they start like ah eh, they you know got to take the kids back to school. They're gonna go play golf, and and they just let that slip through their fingers. Well, yeah. deals don't. If it's a good deal, deals do not sit. Okay, like. I can tell you just in our company, people are like, why don't you advertise properties on your website? It's like, well, because by the time we would pay a web developer to put a, a property on our website, it would be sold already. So if a deal is good, it shouldn't be sitting on a website. It shouldn't be sitting there for too long. So you've got to just take action, get it off the street. A uh, multimillionaire friend of mine, real estate, longtime real estate investor, he's like, just get paper on it and get it off the street. That's what he likes to say. Get it off the street. So you got to take action. Just get a purchase agreement out there. Call the seller, you know, however you're going to do it. Get it under contract and take action. Um, I, I know engineers, I've got a lot of engineer friends and this is where they get hung up. You know, they'll take two years of research <laughs> And then they never take action. So stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Clayton, you're so right there. You know, I, I've, I don't know if you know, but my background is in engineering. So I see you know, a lot <laughs> of my buddies and a lot of my friends and coworkers, they just, you're right. They're stuck in that analysis space and they've got spreadsheets for days and they've modeled, you know, the most intense projections of, you know, this property, but they, they stop there. They fall short. They don't actually go out and write that offer and, you know, put it under contract. And yeah, it's just, it's, this is where the point, this is like the critical point in, in your, in your journey, in your career, where you've really got to add some fuel to the fire and like take that action, like you're saying. So yeah, I love that. And what's the worst that can happen, right? That 
you know, maybe the deal falls through or, you know, maybe it just doesn't end up shaking out as well as you'd hope. You end up getting a 6% return because you didn't anticipate some subfloor that needed to be fixed. Okay. Is that the worst thing? No. Now you've gotten those like early, early jitters out of the way and you're on to your next deal. Yeah. So just do it. And what's the worst that can happen? You can just, if you don't like the deal, put it out on the open market and sell it. You know, there's, there's just people waiting for deals out there. So just sell it, sell it at a 5% return to somebody. And you're going to find like an Australian investor that's going to pick that up because they're, they can't even get anything for under $400,000 in single family homes in Australia. So don't be scared of this kind of stuff. It's ridiculous. Um, all right. Number five on the list is get an inspection. So on every property we do, we, we hire a third party inspection company, go out and they do you know inspections on every property. So we know like what we're buying, we know how much work is involved and all of that. So if you're doing this on your own, always get an inspection. Now, now this doesn't, so in the retail space right now, you know, like in California and other places where like owners are just like waving inspections, uh, sellers are just, or buyers are just waving inspections sure. when buying million dollar homes because there's, it's such a, they're getting into bidding wars, you know? And so the seller is like, Oh, that guy's not going to get an inspection. Then he's get then I'm going to sell it to him because I don't want to wait three weeks while he gets an inspector out there. But we're talking about, you know, properties that probably need work in the, in the investor space that are going to maybe have been sitting vacant for a while, you know, some broken windows need to put some new mechanicals in, or the mechanicals might be a year old, two years old. So get an inspector out there. It's like 300 bucks or so, 150, $300, depending on what part of the country you're in, just get a sense of what you're looking at, you know, and there are inspection companies that will even do just like a five point inspection, which just, you know, roof windows, mechanicals, um, electrical plumbing, right? The main systems that you're going to spend money on, you can actually save some money, a little tip for you. You don't have to do a full blown inspection because in an, as an investor for a rent ready property, you're not going to do a full gut rehab, right? Yeah, right. You want to get it. You want to get the house rent ready. So the, you know, you might want to just get a five point inspection, save yourself some time and money and focus on the main systems in the house that usually require the most amount of money and work anyway. Yeah. And Clayton, we were talking about protecting your downside. I found inspections really are like my biggest hedge against risk. You know, if you can get in there and know before you're going to buy the deal that the HVAC system, you know, needs replaced or, you know, we, we've got, you know, some subfloor issues or whatever it is, you know, you can at least make that decision. Yeah. I'm still going to go through with this property. Here's how I'm going to fix it. Or, Hey, you know, it's too big of a problem. I'm going to back out. I don't want the deal. So yeah, I mean, pay that 150, $300, whatever it is to, you know, get that inspection done. And it'll really save you a lot of headache and, and you know, uh, worry down the line. Yeah. And it lets you walk away from the deal too. And we, we just had a package of 42 properties we were buying and we, you know, ran and paid it. We pay for inspections on all of them from a third party inspection company. We rotate between different companies, you know, who's, who's available, go, go, you know, send us their reports. And yeah, we ended up like canceling like eight, eight of the deals. We just said, we only want the other, you know, 30, whatever it was, um, you know, 36 deals because the, the other ones just needed too much work and we just don't need the headache right now. Um, and so we passed on those other ones. And so, you know, it's good to do, it's good to have it in the back pocket so you can identify and get a sense of what the mechanicals look like, the roof and so forth. So good stuff on number five. All right. Number six, unless you're doing this yourself and I highly recommend against it, unless you're sort of at a multi-level multi-family space where you've got, you know, your own uh, uh, property management company under your own, you know, business LLC or something, you want to go out and find a great property management company. I mean, money is gained or lost at the property management phase. Um, I mean, I've lost money from bad property management companies. If you haven't, then you're not in the real estate business. <laughs> I mean, you just, that's just the name of the game. You know, anybody you talk to has just dealt with bad property management teams. Um, so you got to go out and find a great one. But don't go crazy. You know, um, bottom line is you want somebody who's been established, who's probably been there for a number of years, who knows the neighborhoods, who where you're going to be investing, um, who has, you know, good software, good back end portal to allow you to walk in and take a look at your stuff when you need to for taxes and tax time. You know, you can log in yourself. You don't have to call up their office and have them mail you a copy. We have two property management teams we work with in one of our markets um, in my personal portfolio. And one of them still mails us a paper check. And, <laughs> you know, and, and they're fine. They do a good job. But we're going to move over to this other property management company. I'm going to shift some properties over to this other 
team down there um, because they're just they're they've got all the software and they send out automated things and that it just makes it a little simpler you know with all the tools and bells and whistles that exist today they're just some things that should be easily automated maintenance requests and those types of things find out how they're screening their tenants you know you don't you don't want to go crazy and over screen people because then you your house sits vacant for way too long you know hedge funds learn the hard way they were buying c and b class properties and they were trying to find people that were CEOs of companies to rent their property. <laughs> Guess yeah, what? Right. You're trying to find A-class tenants and C-class properties. Exactly. And so, yeah, maybe, you know, the person didn't have the highest credit in the world, but they've got a good paying job and they've, they're, they've, they don't have any evictions on their record. You know, it's like, you know, you have to be, you have to use common sense and that's where a good property management company will, uh, will, have, will have good common sense. They'll also be aware of being able to raise rents, you know, given market conditions and other things like that. Uh, and they'll be responsive to maintenance requests and they'll be able to get in there on a tenant turnover and be able to do some, uh, do some decent work for you. So get a good property management company. Yeah. And what I, I really think of uh, when you're looking at hiring a property manager, Clayton, I kind of look at it as how do you value your time? Are you going to spend your time managing your own properties, which for some people, that's the right thing to do when they're maybe first getting started or they want to learn the ropes or they want to build their own property management company or do you want to hire that task out and put your time towards better and higher uses of your of your time, you know, and, and growing your portfolio and securing financing, you know, bigger kind of big picture items. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah, and I think it's kind of a thankless job. I mean, they don't make a lot of money and it's it's hard work, um, you know, and, and especially when you're dealing with C and C more than B class, but you know, it's a higher touch point property. So they want to make sure they're putting a good tenant in there because it'll create more headaches for them if they don't. Um, more tenant turnovers. So you want to reduce that. And, you know, uh, the 8% is built into my ROI or the 10% that I would pay a property manager is built into my ROI number when I'm buying the property back in step three. So don't forget <laughs> that I'm already considering paying this, this property management company before I even buy the property. Yeah, um, great point. Most people forget that part. Yeah, awesome. So Step seven. What is it? Yeah. Uh, step seven. Honestly, it's don't rest on your laurels. Step seven is rinse and repeat. I love so, it. So, you know, you want to get out there and rinse and repeat and go and take action and do it all over again. Now, okay, maybe that first property you paid for with cash. You added some value. You've got a tenant in there. Great. Maybe you can pull some equity out of that. Do a cash out refinance. Pull some money back out with a local bank, whatever and then go and rinse and repeat. Maybe you have a good private lender that'll lend you, you know, 4%, 5%, whatever, you know, pull that money back out and, and, and do it, do it all over again. So don't stop after that first deal, unless that's the goal. Like, unless that's your goal, you just wanted one property. Great. But if your goal is seven, you better keep going. Yeah, I love it. Well, Clayton, you know, you've got this seven step process here. And if, if somebody follows this process step by step, they're really almost insured going to, you know, achieve financial freedom at some point. Like you mentioned, you know, first off, setting that goal, visualizing it, writing it down. So it's the forefront of your mind. You mentioned that you're, you're going to achieve that goal if you do those simple steps. So yeah, absolutely love it. And you've got a lot of experience helping people get their first property under contract, buy that first deal, grow their portfolio, achieve financial freedom. And you do it out of like a very, I just like where you come from with it because you know, you were at one point, you know, in the in a similar position trying to build uh, wealth, achieve financial freedom through real estate investing, and you've started helping others organically. So kind of talk about what you do there at Morris Invest and how your team helps other people do this thing. Yeah, I mean, we, we do a number of properties per month um, where we, you know, we acquire them, we will go in with our team and you know, assess what needs to be done. We get their inspection. We go in and we say, all right, we need to do countertops, all new mechanicals. The roof needs to be replaced. Um, that's on one we're just doing today, actually. And then we make them available for our clients. They, they just go to our website. They book a call with us. We spend 30 minutes on the phone kind of getting to know you. What does your freedom number look like? What are your goals? You know, where do you want to go? And then uh, if you're ready to jump on a property, great. Well, if we have one available, we send it over to you. You grab it. And you close like 10 days later and you're off to the races and then our team does the rest. You know, we can either get it up and running with our rehab crews that we work with in our different markets. Um, and we work with all kinds of different property management teams in our different markets that we have a long relationship with. And you start to focus on building that portfolio. So, you know, cause I mean, the bottom line is not everyone 
can do this on their own, right? If you work long hours. So I started Morris Invest because I know like people are frustrated with, oh, I hear real estate's the number one way to build wealth, but I just don't know how to do it myself or I work long hours and then my weekends are valuable. I'm not going to be out trying to find properties in my backyard and there are $600,000 houses in my backyard. So that doesn't work for Clayton's formula. So what am I going to do? <laughs> So, you know, there was a need there in that way. And we only take on, you know, we only work with certain clients that, you know, that book a call and we, we feel it's a good fit. So yeah, that's what we do. We try to make it super simple. Yeah, I love it. And there's a ton of value for somebody getting started investing in real estate to have a trusted partner like yourself, Clayton, you know, that that knows those those pitfalls and, you know, how to navigate the process and, you know, what kind of properties look at, what markets, how to do it. I mean, there's you know, you've got many years of experience that you bring to the table and help somebody, you know, learn from all the mistakes and lessons learned of, you know, your own. So great stuff there. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, we, we've definitely learned our lesson with, you know, some property <laughs> management things we've worked with and what to avoid and, you know, going forward. So we never have those, you know, those problems again. So, you know, you learn from those mistakes and you, you try to just dust yourself off, keep going because, Otherwise, someone else is going to buy that property and you're going to be working that W-2 job, driving two hours to and from work every day and spend the next three years doing the same thing without adding to your net worth and adding to your portfolio and creating that passive income, and giving more, you know, spending more time doing what you want to do in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And if nothing else, Clayton, I highly recommend all the listeners to go out there and download that uh, freedom. What What is it you call it, Clayton? That yeah, we just call it our freedom number cheat sheet. Um, it's uh, and all of our resources are just at morrisinvest.com. And if you just go to morrisinvest.com slash freedom, it's right there. It'll pop up. You can just download it for free. And, uh, you know, we've got the investing in real estate podcast, which we do three times a week to help people on, you know, the single family journey. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out check that out as well, man. Yeah, great. Yeah. So it's a great resource. I highly recommend if you're a numbers junkie, or you know, you're interested in financial freedom at all, you'll almost likely have fun filling it out. So yeah, really cool resource that Clayton's put together completely free. Clayton, you guys over there at Morris, Morris Invest also have a ton of YouTube content and really great videos. So tell us, you know, a little bit about where audience members can learn more about you, what are the best resources and, uh, you know, you know, point us to where we can find you. Yeah, I think the biggest, you know, where we put our most attention is I do, we do a lot of videos on YouTube. So if you just go to Morris Invest, our YouTube channel, um, I think we've got a, I'm close to 300 videos, but we've got an entire like private money series. It's like five video series that walks you through how to get private money. Um, we, Natalie and I share sort of our story in a five part series, a playlist as well, um, which I think would really be helpful to your audience if you're just getting started. We kind of walk you through our first deals, how we stumbled, you know, all that kind of stuff. You want to check that out. Um, and we've also got a playlist called Just Getting Started. So and that's honestly <laughs> it's our most popular playlist. It just crushes. So people go over and watch those. Um, it walks you through step-by-step -step understanding ROI, uh, you know, how to find your first properties, how to assess property management. All those pieces are in that playlist. Uh, so I would suggest that that's probably the best place to go. Yeah, awesome, Clayton. Well, hey, as we're wrapping up here, do you have any parting piece of advice or guidance you'd like to leave with the audience members? Yeah, you know, I just think don't get one, one thing that I've really been working on over the past couple of years is, you know, the, the present moment is the only thing that matters. It's, it's, you know, the true, the tr and this is a little esoteric for people, but it really is true. <laughs> like the only version of Clayton that really exists is the is sort of in this present moment, being here with you talking and, and going back and forth in this present moment. You know, I'm not worried about yesterday anymore. And I'm not worried about what tomorrow looks like. So if you can sit down with intention and sort of set your goals and be honest with yourself and just sit there and be in that moment and really see visualize your family going forward and how you want things to look for yourself and be present with that. That's how you set an intention. That's how you set your goal. And that's how you can change your life. Yeah, I love it, Clayton. Well, hey, you know, thanks for that. And thanks for coming back on the show. Once again, sharing so much actionable content with the guest. It's always fun talking with you. So yeah, really, really appreciate you coming back on the show and look forward to having you back on in the future. Hey, anytime, Jacob. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Clayton. That wraps up our episode today with our guest, Clayton Morris. Well, hey, Clayton, once again, has provided so much great content, actionable resources for us to implement here on the show. I'm really looking forward to having Clayton back on in the future. 
Well, for all of those resources mentioned in the show, you can find those in the show notes by clicking on your screen or checking out the show notes at www.jacobairs.com. Search for Clayton's podcast and you'll find those. But you'll find morrisinvest.com and then you'll find the link to that free freedom number cheat sheet that Clayton has put together. Really fun, awesome resource there. So highly recommend that. For more information, resources, and to connect with me, you know where to find me. That's at www.jacobairs.com. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.